Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna devotees Welcome to our Ishopanishad, Bhakti Shastri. Everyone can hear me okay? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes Maharaj, very loud and clear, Maharaj. Okay, good. So, let's have a little revision what we talked about in the last class. Anyone remember anything? Remember we spoke about ekatvam anupashyata. Who knows the meaning? Ekatvam anupashyata. Someone? Someone know the meaning? Nobody? Can I come Maharaj? Yes, what's your name? I'm Gandharvika Maharaj. Gandharvika Radharani. Oh, very nice. You know the meaning? Ekat Vamanu Pashata means? It means one should the unity of all living entities from the viewpoint of revealed scriptures. Well, there's a special significance though. I mean, if we just simply... What, so what do the scriptures tell us about the oneness of all living entities? In what way are they one? Um, they are qualitatively one, but quantitatively different. One living entity is qualitatively one with the Lord. Right, one in quality with the Lord. Right, that's the point, that they're one in quality, different in quantity, right? Yes, Maharaj. We're, we're very small and the Lord is very great. We're tiny compared to Him. But the qualities are more or less the same. So we say one in quality with the Lord. And there's so many different living entities. How many living entities are there? How many kinds of living entities? 8.4 right, eight mil eight million, right, 8.4 million, 84 light species of life. And how many human species? 400,000. 4 lakh, right. So, we're small. There's many more aquatics, many more plants and trees, many more insects and so many other creatures. We're we're the minority race, but we're one in qualities. It's a oneness there in qualities. And we all have a relationship with the Lord, all right? So that's very nice. So our relationship with the Lord is that we're meant to, we're meant to serve Him. He's the master and we're his servants. So all different living entities, they have a oneness, they have consciousness, they have some kind of consciousness. The consciousness will be different in the different animals, different species of life, but they all have consciousness. And that consciousness is coming from? Where does the consciousness come from? Nantini? Krishna. Consciousness is coming from where? Nantini? Is it from soul? From the soul, thank you, yes. Consciousness is coming from the soul. It's a symptom of the soul, right? Consciousness in the body is a symptom of the soul. And we spoke also, remember, at the end we had a little discussion about uh, 
people, people were talking, some people say that we only live once. We only live once. Some, and so we, we talked about how to deal with that. And so people who say like that, we only live once, we can tell them, that, yeah, yes, for, for you, you better only live once. Because you're such a rascal, you do so many bad things, that if you live, if you have to be born again, you'll get a terrible birth. So, <laughs> so for you, it, then it's, it's better you only live once. Because I wouldn't like to think what kind of birth you'll get in your next life. You've done so many bad things. <laughs> we can tell them like that. It's like that story, you know, about the, the, the astrologer who came to the town and the four, the four men brought their sons. The king brought his son and the astrologer told the, ki the king, may your son live forever. And then the rishi brought his son and the astrologer told the rishi, may your son's death come soon. And then the devotee brought his son and the astrologer says, doesn't matter if you live or if you die. And the butcher brought his son and this, the astrologer told the butcher's son, told the butcher, better your son doesn't live and doesn't die. So how to, how to understand this? Well, the king's son was the king, because he's the son of the king, he did a lot of bad things, nobody could control him, and he had a lot of money, and he did all sinful activities. And so when he died, he would suffer a lot. So the astrologer blessed him, don't die. Rajaputra Charanjiva, live forever. <laughs> right? And then the, the Rishi's son, he's living with his father in the forest, they live very simply, they do a lot of austerity, they just drink the water from the stream, they just eat the wild potatoes or the wild leaves and herbs. So when he dies, he'll get a very good birth because he did so much austerity. So the astrologer blessed him, may your death come soon, you'll get a very good birth. And the devotee's son, doesn't matter if he lives or if he dies. Because he's a devotee, every day he's chanting Hare Krishna and eating prasada and seeing the deities, very nice life. When he dies, he'll, continue, he'll get a birth again in a devotee family or he'll go back to Godhead and he'll continue to do devotional service. So it doesn't matter if he lives or if he dies. But the butcher's son, don't live and don't die because he's living in hell and when he dies he would go to hell also. So like that we have to explain to people. Of course people don't like to hear. Now one devotee brought up an interesting point. One devotee told me that, well, they have a family member or they have a relative who is a vegetarian and who doesn't gamble and who doesn't take any alcohol and they're a vegan actually. So, but they, they don't like any religion. What they, they, they don't like to hear about God, but they're, they're very careful. They, they're vegan, they don't gamble, they don't, uh, they don't uh, take intoxication. So what is their position? What is their situation? Anybody like to say? They are the innocent. They are the innocent being. They are what? Your, your voice is not... We consider them as the innocent. They are innocent. So what will happen to we them? We consider them as the innocent. Well, what does that mean? Innocent. Do you think they don't get sinful reactions? But you, 
Okay. They get the sinful reaction Which? from the food they not offered to Krishna. Foods not offered to Krishna. Yeah, they get some reaction for that. They're going to get some karma for that. But they're very, they're vegan. They don't take any animal products. They don't take uh, any milk or cheese. They don't even take honey. Maybe all this butter, no butter like that. They avoid all the animal products and the, uh, the, they take only the vegetables and fruits. So they, they get some karma, but they, they don't get a lot of heavy karma because not doing any sinful. So what would happen to them? What would be the... Would be Mar Yes? Maharaj, can I try? Okay. Who is that? So what do you want to say? They won't get liberated. So what they will... They will come back, you know, they will take the birth. Uh -huh. Where will they take birth? Now once they leave the body, they will take the birth again. Where? In this uh, universe, this earth. Oh. Oh, they will go back to heaven, then they come back and take the birth again. Yeah, they might go to heaven. They might, you know, if they're, if they're you know, kind of pious like that, they didn't, you know, they didn't do a lot of sinful activity, and they're vegetarian, vegan, although they didn't offer the food, but they're, they're, they're not devotees, but, you know, they're not greatly sinful. So either they come, either they go to heaven for some time, and, or they come back here on earth. Yeah. They're kind of materially pious. They're materially pious, but they have no, no understanding about God. They don't like to hear about God. But at the same time, they're a little careful that they, you know, they're vegan and they're, they don't take intoxication and these kind of things. So we have some kind of thought, maybe they're just being careful in case there is a God, they don't want to get suffering. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, they, they certainly don't get liberated, but they get a kind of pious life. Okay. Maharaj, can I also say that they are in the mode of goodness or something like that? Yeah, to some extent. To some extent they're in the mode of goodness, right. You have to see how they deal with other people, how they behave. But it appears, you know, that as far as their eating, their habits go, they don't have greatly gross sinful habits. No intoxication, no gambling, no meat eating, these things. So it's good. But of course, they, they're not chanting the holy name. They're not chanting the holy name. They're not reading any scriptures. They don't, you know, they don't they become a little disturbed when somebody tries to preach to them. Yeah, basically that's the mode of goodness. So, so Maharaj, can we say in the next birth you will take birth in the family of a restaurant family or some business class family? Oh, I don't know about that. Maybe. But, you see, it depends how much they're influenced by passion and ignorance. You see, it's not just only the habits, you have to see the other things, you have to see, you know, what is their working life, how they behave, you know, how strongly they're influenced by the modes of passion and ignorance. Because they're not, they're not, in, they're not in pure goodness, they're in goodness, but they're not in goodness all the time. There's going to be also passion, there's going to be ignorance, you know, they're going to get angry sometimes, they're going to be greedy sometimes, they're going to be lazy sometimes. You know, sometimes with people it's just laziness. You ask them, they just don't want to chant, they're so lazy. They don't want to wake up in the morning, they're so lazy. The laziness is there. You know, they don't want to have to admit that they should do certain things. Some just the laziness, that's a, the mode of ignorance. Okay? 
So we'll go on. Let me see. I'll put the text up here. Can you see it? Yes, Maharaj. We're on text number text number eight. Who would like to chant the mantra for us tonight? Anybody? A little difficult tonight. Maybe Rukmini Pati can do it. Can you Prabhu? I can try Maharaj. Okay. Can I try? Okay. Saparya Chakram Akayam Avranam. Saparya Chakram Akayam Kavir Mani Si Paribhur Swayam Bhur Yata 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 Rudam Yada Chat Chaswati Bya Sam Yata Yata Okay, go ahead, read the translation. Such a person must actually know the greatest of all, the personality of Godhead, who is unembodied, omniscient, beyond reproach, without waste, pure and uncontaminated, the self-sufficient philosopher who has been fulfilling everyone's desire since time immemorial. So the translation begins, such a person, who is that person? Who do you think that person is? Uttama Adhikari. Yes, the Uttama Adhikari, maybe also the Madhyam Adhikari also. Madhyam Adhikari also can be pure devotee and he can also know the, the Supreme Lord. Right? So, the, there, we're hearing about some of the characteristics and qualities of the Personality of Godhead. How, how it's known, how they're seen, how the, how the pure devotees like the Madhyam Adhikaris and the Uttama Adhikaris, how they see the Personality of Godhead. They see Him as the greatest of all, right? One above all others, who is unembodied. We'll hear about this in a little while. Unembodied means he doesn't have a material body. Un unembodied means without a body, without a material body. Omniscient, omniscient, meaning he knows everything. He knows everything because he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, so he knows about everything. Be beyond reproach, beyond reproach means we cannot find any fault with him. Without veins, you know, our body we need veins, we have to veins to supply the blood for our bodies, but he doesn't need veins because he doesn't have a body like us. He is pure and uncontaminated, very important. We will have to discuss that very carefully, how he is pure and uncontaminated. The self-sufficient philosopher who has been fulfilling everyone's desire since time immemorial. Self-sufficient philosopher self-sufficient, you know, he, he doesn't depend on other people to get knowledge or to know things or to provide for him. He's self-sufficient. 
No, we encourage people, be self-sufficient, don't depend on others. So Krishna is self-sufficient, doesn't depend on anyone. And at the same time, he can fulfill everyone's desire since time immemorial. So we have to be very careful what we desire, <laughs> right? We get the result of our desires. We have to be very careful. Okay, go ahead, Ram, uh, Rukmini Pati Prabhu, you can read the first paragraph. Yes, Raj. Here is the description of the transcendental and eternal form of the Absolute Personality of God. The Supreme Lord is not formless. He has his own transcendental form, which is not at all similar to the forms of the mundane world. The forms of the living entities in this world are embodied in material nature and they work like any material machine. The anatomy of the material body must have a mechanical construction with weights and so forth. But the transcendental body of the Supreme Lord has nothing like weights. It is clearly stated here that he is unembodied, which means that he, there is no difference between his body and his soul nor is he forced to accept a body according to the laws of nature as we are in materially conditioned soul alive the soul is different from the gross embodiment and subtle mind for the supreme lord however there is never any such difference between him and his body and mind he is the complete whole and his mind body and he himself are all one and the same Oh, okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. So, very nice. Very much, Maharaj. So, Srila Prabhupada is elaborating, he's expanding on the, this description of the Supreme Lord, the Personality of Godhead. First point is, he, he is not formless, meaning he has a form, but his form is not material. It's a transcendental form, right? So what is his form made of, Rukmini Pati? His form? Holy spiritual Maharaj. Yeah, what, so what's it made of? Transcendental uh, form made of... Uh, what, how, we, how, how you can describe it? He's not, he's not an embodied... Uh, yeah, but... It's made of certain elements, certain characteristics. Just like we say, Ishwar. Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Yes, yeah, Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Ah, Ishwara Paramakrishna, Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Right? He has a form of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. Right? Is, yes. is our form eternity, knowledge, and bliss? No. <laughs> no. We have part of it. What is our form? Our form is <laughs> it's the opposite. It's not eternal. It's temporary. It's not full of knowledge. It's full of ignorance. And it's not blissful. Yes. It's miserable. <laughs> We're just the opposite. Because Krishna has a a transcendental form, a spiritual form, but the material form... Oh no, here we go again. <laughs> Another storm just beginning. Heavy thunder. So, maybe I'll get... we're going to get disturbed. Anyway, quickly we'll go on. <laughs> so, spiritual form not material and our form it's like a mechanical construction we have veins and blood and so on veins to pump the blood around the body from the heart through the different parts of the body veins are there veins going in our arms and through our legs carrying the blood back and forth but Krishna doesn't have a body like that. 
His body is fully spiritual. And we are told also, he is un unembodied, means he, he has a body which is not material. There is no difference between his body and his soul. And so this is very… we have a body, material body, but the soul is spiritual. Krishna's body and soul are the same, no difference. Not only his body but his mind also is not different from his body and from his soul. So body, his body, his mind is all one. But we have the mind is material, subtle, the body is material, the soul is spiritual. Then we are told also Krishna is not forced to accept a body by the laws of nature as we are. We are controlled by the material nature. We take birth in different species of life. We take birth in different families, different countries according to our karma, by the laws of nature. But Krishna can choose where he comes. He comes in the home, in the family of his devotees, his pure devotees. So the soul is different from the body for us, but not for Krishna. He is a complete whole, body, mind, he himself, all one and the same. Okay, very nice description. Let's go ahead. Gandharvika Maharaji, Gandharvika Radharani, can you read for us? Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> In the Brahma Samhita 5.1, there is similar descriptions of the Supreme Lord. He is described there as Sachit Ananda Vigraha, which means that he is the eternal form fully representing transcendental existence, knowledge and bliss. As such, he does not require a separate body or mind as we do in material existence. The Vedic literature clearly states that, that the Lord's transcendental body is completely different from ours. Thus, he is sometimes described as formless. This means that he has no form like ours and that he is devoid of a form which we can conceive of. In the Brahma Samhita 5.32, it is further stated that with each and every part of his body, he can do the work of the other senses. This means that the Lord can walk with his hands, accept things with his legs, see with his hands and feet, eat with his eyes, etc. In the Shruti mantras, it is also said that although the Lord has no hands and legs like ours, he has a different type of hands and legs by which he can accept all that we offer him and run faster than anyone. These points are confirmed in this eighth mantra through the use of words like Sukram, Omnipotent. Omnipotent, right. So the Lord is omnipotent, we're not omnipotent. The, and we, but we sing about this every day when we do the, when we greet the deities and you play the Govinda song. Angani yasya shakalendriya vritti manti asyanti panti kalayanti chiram jaganti ananda chidmaya sadujwalaha vigrahasya govinda madipursam tamaham pajam. Every morning when we greet the deities, we hear Yamuna Devi Dasi sing so beautifully the Govinda song about how the Lord is omnipotent, that with each of his senses he can perform the acts of the other senses. He can see with his hands and feet, he can eat with his eyes when we offer food to him, right? He can eat with his eyes. We also try to eat with our eyes, of course we also enjoy eating with the eyes, but we enjoy even more when we eat with the mouth. But there's a little bit of enjoyment with the eyes. So this is Krishna's omnipotency. 
that he can do all of these incredible things. So his form is not like ours at all, but he has a form and he has hands and legs and he has sen senses, just like us, but different from us. We say man is made in the image of God. Some people think we have made God in the image of man, but it's not like that. It's we are made in the image of God because God has a form, but His form is perfect. Our form is not so perfect because we are trying to compete. We are the competitors with God. So He gives us the body according to our qualification. But for Krishna, He's got this incredible form and He's omnipotent. He can do all of these things. He doesn't need arms and legs like us. His legs don't get tired standing up. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama Rama. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Oh. Hare Krishna. The holy teachers and works exactly in the original way of the Lord by virtue of the Lord. Yeah, we were talking about the Lord's body, how it's omnipotent how he can perform all these activities with his different senses. Senses. This was the point, that his senses are inter interchangeable. He can eat with his eyes. He can accept all that we offer him. He has a different type of hands and legs. He can move faster than anyone. Maybe you read in Krishna's pastimes how Krishna came across the battlefield and there was a demon chasing him, Kalanemi. Remember when Krishna was in Mathura, he was attacked by two armies, Jarasandha and Kalanemi. So Kalanemi came after Krishna and he was trying to catch Krishna, but he could never catch him. <laughs> Krishna was so fast and Krishna led him into a cave and then there was Muchikunda was laying there sleeping. Muchikunda opened his eyes and he burned the demon into ashes because Muchikunda had a benediction that whoever would wake him up, he would burn to ashes. So, <laughs> so Krishna knew this. So Krishna didn't want to kill this demon Kalanemi. He didn't want to kill him himself. He had Muchikunda kill him. So this way Kalanemi got burned to ashes. Krishna didn't have to bother killing him. The demon wasn't qualified to be killed by Krishna. So Krishna had this Muchikunda kill him. <laughs> Very clever. Krishna leaving, Krishna running from the battle. Krishna is called Ranchor Krishna. Ranchor Krishna, one who leaves the battlefield. So Krishna leaving the battlefield is very special. 
Sometimes people say, oh, you leave the battlefield, that's a coward. But Krishna was not a coward, it was, it was a plan. Krishna had these tricks to deal with these different people. So Krishna is very cunning, very clever. So, same way his senses are also very amazing, they can do all these wonderful things. He can eat with his eyes, he can see with his hands and feet, he can walk with, <laughs> walk with his hands. <laughs> so it's a, it's, the senses are exchangeable, that's the point. He can smell the flower, he doesn't just need his nose to smell, he can smell by his ears or by his uh, eyes. In this way all the senses are exchangeable, so omnipotent. That's the meaning of the word shukram. And so it's described. We say, we're hearing this every day. When you, when you go to temple and you greet the deities and you hear the Govinda music, we should know the translation. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, whose transcendental form is full of uh, bliss. And uh, how, how, I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who's, oh, whose head is bedecked with peacock feathers, figure of beauty is tinged with the blue clouds, and whose unique loveliness is charming millions of cupids. I worship Govinda, primeval Lord, whose transcendental form is, true, is full of truth, bliss, and substantiality. Each of the limbs of his transcendental body possess within themselves the full-fledged functions of all the organs, and eternally sees, maintains and manifests infinite universes, both spiritual and mundane. So this way every morning when we go to greet the deities and they play the Govinda music like this, we meditate on the Lord in this way, how He is omnipotent, His senses form the acts of all the other senses. Each of the limbs of his transcendental body possess within themselves the full-fledged functions of all the organs and sees, maintains and manifests infinite universes, both spiritual and mundane. Okay, we'll go ahead. The Lord's worshipable form. Somebody can read again? Or oh, you've read it already, right? Hare Krishna, are you there? Hare Krishna, dear devotees, I think. Um, Hare Bo, I'm back. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yeah, I'm back. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay. We're going on to the next paragraph. The Lord's worshipable form, Archavigraha, which is installed in temples by authorized acharyas who have realized the Lord in terms of Mantra 7. Okay, who remembers Mantra 7? What did it say? We've realized the Lord in terms of Mantra 7. We'll have to have a look, right, to see Mantra 7 again. <laughs> Mantra 7. Okay, here we go. One who sees all living entities his spiritual sparks in quality one with the Lord becomes a true knower of things. What then can be illusion or anxiety for him? So Mantra 7, we see all living entities in quality one with the Lord. Right? So Prabhupada's writing here, one who sees, where is it? Yeah. The Lord's form, which is installed in temples by authorized acharyas, who have realized the Lord in terms of Mantra 7, is none different from the original form of the Lord. 
one who sees all living entities in quality one with the Lord. So they have realized the Lord in terms of the, they, they see all living entities in quality one with the Lord, not in quantity. So then this, the deity is none different from the original form of the Lord. The, Lord, the Lord's original form is Sri Krishna. Krishna expands himself into unlimited numbers of forms. Baladev Rama, Nishinga Varaha. All of these forms are one and the same personality of Godhead. Similarly, the Archa Vigraha, worshipped in temples, is also an expanded form of the Lord. Right? The, the deity in the temple is another incarnation of the Lord. The Lord enters into the form of the deity. By worshipping the Archa Vigraha, one can at once approach the Lord who accepts the service of a devotee by his omnipotent energy. Right? So that we offer our service to Krishna, we are offering flowers, we offer incense, we offer food, we are doing different things, we offer, we bathe the Lord, we do all these different services for the deity and Krishna accepts that service by his omnipotent energy, that He's there in the Deity. And when we worship the Deity, that's the Lord, the Lord Himself is there and He's accepting that service. Just like sometimes the Pujari may be dressing the Deity and sometimes he may stick pins in the Deity. So in the dream, at night, Krishna may come in the dream to the Pujari and he may tell the pujari, you be more careful with your pins, you're sticking pins in me every day. Some pujaris, they have pins like that. Krishna comes to them and tells them, stop, you, you stop sticking pins in me. And there's another devotee, there's a once pastime, Pundarik Vijanidi, he was a great devotee. He had a, he, he was he saw that one, one uh, the pujari who was worshipping Lord Jagannath had not washed the cloth. You know when you get new cloth, it has some starch in it. So he had not washed the cloth, so it still had starch in it. So he was not pleased with the pujari. But at night Lord Jagannath came and Lord Jagannath slapped the face of Pundarik Vijaniti. And when he woke up in the morning, his face was all swollen because Lord Jagannath had beat him. So you have to be very careful when you worship the deity because it's, it's, if you don't serve the deity properly, then Krishna may come and tell you and may come and beat you. You have to be very careful. So the Archa Vigraha descends at the request of the Acharyas, the holy teachers and works exactly in the original way of the Lord, by virtue of the Lord's omnipotency. Right? We, when we bring the deity, then the teacher comes to install the deity, and the teacher also requests the Lord to enter into the deity and to accept the service from the devotees. We always do a nice service for the installation of the deity and so this way the Lord he enters at the request of the teachers at the request of the advanced devotees the Lord enters into the deity so then Prabhupada said foolish people who have no knowledge of Sri Ishopanishad or any of the other Sh Shruti mantras Remember what Shruti means? What does Shruti mean? Remember there was Shruti and Smriti. Sabdam, Maharaj. Huh? Sabdam. Listening. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, listening. So what, what kind of, what books are Shruti, what, where will we find the Shruti mantras? In what books? Uh, 
Vedas, Maharaj? Yes, in the but Vedas. Yeah. Shruti means the Vedas, right? The four Vedas. Rig, Yajur, Sama, Atarva. Shruti means the four Vedas, the original four Vedas. So the Shruti mantras. This Ishopanishad is also Shruti. The Ishopanishad also comes from Shruti, from the Vedas. It's from Yajur Veda. Right? So foolish people have no knowledge of any other Shruti mantra. Consider the Archa Vigraha. Archa Vigra meaning the deity in the temple, the form of the Lord, which is worshipped by pure devotees to be made of material elements. You see this? Foolish people, they don't understand that the deity is not material. The form may appear to be material, but it's, well, what, what has happened? What happened to the material form? It's from the spiritual. Yes, it became spiritualized because the pure devotees, the teacher, the pure devotees, they know how to turn matter into spirit. And with the form of the deity, they invite Krishna to enter into the deity, it becomes spiritual, a spiritual form. Right? Not, not just some statues, not just some, some block of wood or, or some metal. It's, a, it's transcendental. The Lord enters into the deity and He accepts our service through the deity. He accepts our worship and our offerings and our prayers, everything. So this form may be seen as material by the imperfect eyes of foolish people or Kanista Adhikaris. <laughs> Remember Kanista Adhikari? Who can tell me what, what's Kanista Adhikari? Kanista Adhikari is uh, materialistic and uh, they, they only see the temple, they still the Lord only in the temple and they like to quarrel. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Yes, some, anything else? He cannot say who is devotee and, and not devotee. Yes, right. They, they don't know who is the devotee and who is not the devotee. They only know the Lord and the temple. And they often criticize and find fault with devotees. Because they... You know, they have that habit, they argue. Who do they argue with? They will often argue with devotees, even. So this is a, this is a, they're, they're called materialistic devotees. They're junior devotees. Of course, they can, they can advance, they can progress. How do they progress? How can I... Yes, by association. Who do they need to associate with? Uh, with uh, Madhima Dihari and Uttama Dihari. Yes, right. Yeah, they have to associate with the senior devotees. And then with the mercy of the senior devotees, then they can come up from the Kanista platform. When they see the Kanista, when they see the Madhyam devotees preaching and like, then they may become changed, they may become inspired. And so, Kanista, they often just criticize, they only find the faults and complain, and they're only worship, they can only see God in the deity. They don't see Him in the hearts of all the people, they don't think about preaching. Okay, so this form seems to be material to them, but such people do not know that the Lord being omnipotent and omniscient can transform matter into spirit and spirit into matter as He desires. Right? <laughs> he, can, he can enter the deity, He can also leave the deity. 
If people don't take proper care of the deity, if they're not respecting the deity, you can just leave the deity. So sometimes, sometimes like that the deity is neglected. And so you can see, when you see the deity neglected, you know, there's no more life in the deity. Worship once a year. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna can award the title of High Court Judge. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Maharaj, shall I uh, unshare my screen? Would you yeah. like to share your screen, Maharaj? Yes, yeah, please. Okay, so, sorry, a very heavy thunderstorm here this evening. It had been pleasant all day, <laughs> just seemed to come just at the time of our class, the heavy thunderstorm. Otherwise the power had been very good all day. Okay, we'll go ahead. Bhagavad Gita 9.11.12 The Lord regrets the fallen condition of men with little knowledge who deride him because he descends like a man into this world. So Prabhupada is quoting the Bhagavad Gita, people with little knowledge, in other words not very intelligent people, they cannot understand the presence of the Lord. They think if he comes into this world, then he must be a man like them. They cannot understand his transcendental nature. Such poorly informed persons do not know the omnipotence of the Lord. Thus the Lord does not manifest himself in full to the mental speculators. Mental speculators means the Gyanis. The Vedantists, the Mayavadis, these people, he can be appreciated only in proportion to one's surrender to him. The fallen condition of the living entities is due entirely to forgetfulness of their relationship with God. So people don't like to surrender to Krishna, they surrender to Maya. <laughs> You know that, but, but sometimes we talk about independence. People say, I like to be free. Is anybody free? Do you have freedom? Not really. You know, our, you know what our independence means? It means to either choose between Krishna or Maya. That is our independence, that is our free, freedom. People say, oh, if I become a Hare Krishna, I'm not free to do what I like. They're not free anyway. They're controlled by the material energy. They're controlled by the mode of passion and the mode of ignorance. They're thinking they're free. That is their ignorance. That's their illusion. They're forced by the tamagun and the rajagun, the passion and the ignorance. 
they're forced, they do things like drinking, smoking, drugs, so many nonsense things, polluting the mind and body. They're controlled to do these things by the material nature. And why? Because they've, for, they've forgotten Krishna. So, we're trying to bring about a change in consciousness, help people to remember Krishna. That's why we're chanting, we do sankirtan, we do book distribution, we have festivals. We're trying to help people remember their relationship with Krishna. He's with us. He's always, what has He been supplying? He's been giving us, who can say, Gandharvika. Uh, yeah. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. We around half an hour to 45 minutes. Okay, Maharaj is here. We'll continue later, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, we're so happy to get to have you back. <laughs> oh, Krishna. Mm. Okay. So we were hearing about the Lord supplying goods to the living entities. What has He been supplying? Anybody like to say? Kundalata Maharaji, did He supply anything to you? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Did the Lord has, has the Lord been supplying goods? It says the Lord is the Lord has been supplying goods to the living entities from time immemorial. So did the Lord give you anything? Did he supply anything for you? Yes, Maharaj. What did you get from him? So no, I'm been supplying goods from time immemorial for a very long time. From the beginning of the creation, it's been supplying goods to everyone, to all the living entities. What things have you been getting? I'm getting this human form also from him. Okay. But that's not really that's not really goods. You know, supplying goods. Water, air. Yeah. What? Water. Air. Sunshine. Speak. Sunshine. Sunshine. Yeah, oh, really? Rain. Rain. Oh, Rain. yeah. Yeah. Um, earth, water, fire, air, ether. None. None of you get any food. He doesn't feed you. Yes. Of course, supplying goods, he supplies the food, food which you eat, he supplies the clothes which you wear, supplies the materials to build your houses, supplies your cars or your motorbikes, whatever you use. It's all coming from him. He supplies all these things. Not just only the the air and the the wind and the rain, but all these things, everything, it's all his. He's supplying it. 
we often we don't appreciate that it's by the, we live by the grace of God. Isn't it? You agree? Yes, Maharaj. I am agree. Oh, good. Okay, so long as you can hear me. A living being desires something and the Lord supplies the object of that desire in proportion to one's qualification. Right? It, it all depends on our qualification as well. It's not just desire. We say man proposes and God disposes, but he disposes according to our qualification to receive. So we may desire, we, we desire, well we have so many, we desire a home, we get, we get a home, we desire a, a family, we get a family, we desire a job, we get a job, according to our karma, according to qualification. Then Prabhupada gives the example, the high court judge, he has to have, the, he must have the qualification, but he must also, he must also be awarded the title of high court judge. Many people have the qualification. Many people may be qualified to be the judge. You know, they, they'll be, they'll have to pick out who they think will be the best judge. So there'll be several lawyers there and the, they will have to decide which person they think is the best one to be the high court judge. But it, so you have to, it's not just only having the qualification, you have to get, you, it has to be awarded to you. So qualification is not sufficient for one to occupy the post. It must be awarded by some superior authority. Similarly, the Lord awards enjoyment to living entities in proportion to their qualifications. But good qualifications in themselves are not sufficient to enable one to receive awards. The mercy of the Lord is also required. Oh, we have to get the mercy of the Lord. It's not enough just to have good qualifications. You need also Krishna's mercy. How do we get Krishna's mercy? Well, it's up to Krishna. Krishna chooses who he, get, who he thinks will be worthy to get his mercy. So many people have good qualifications, but that's not enough. It's not just only the good karma. Just like I was saying, somebody's a, you know, they're, they, they, may, they may have good, edu they do good work, they have no sinful ha habits, no bad activities, but they don't have any religion also. They don't believe in God, they don't do anything. So they don't get the mercy of God. They don't, they don't like to hear about God, they don't like to serve God. They may have good qualifications, or they're vegetarian, or they don't gamble, or they don't take intoxication. Oh, so many good qualifications. But why don't they get the mercy of the Lord? Because they don't recognize the, the Lord. They don't want to serve Him. Ordinary, ordinarily, the living being does not know what to ask from the Lord, nor which post to seek. <laughs> yeah, we're not very intelligent. We don't know what to ask for. If, you, if we're given a wish, what will we ask for? Oh, I want a nice home. Oh, I want a, a, a big car. Oh, I want more children. <laughs> you know, so many things like this. We don't know really what to ask for. So when the living being comes to know his constitutional position, however, he asks to be accepted into the transcendental association of the Lord in order to render transcendental loving service unto him. So that's what we should really want. There was one man came to Prabhupada 
there was this one American gospel singer and he was singing songs about the Lord and praising the Lord. But he came to Prabhupada and he asked Prabhupada, he said, he said, what to pray for? He said, what should I pray for? He didn't know what to pray for. But to Prabhupada it was very easy, very clear to him. Prabhupada told him, you should pray to the Lord, please engage me in your service. Please give me a chance to serve you. That's our prayer. And that's why we chant Hare Krishna mantra. O Supreme Lord Krishna, O Supreme Energy of the Lord Hari, please engage me in your service. So this is our constant prayer. Everybody hearing? Are you there? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Are you, are you praying to Krishna like that? Yes, Maharaj. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> ah, sort of? What does that mean? <laughs> My goodness, I have to check your prayers. <laughs> Unfortunately, living beings under the influence of material nature ask for many other things. And they are described in the Bhagavad Gita as having divided or splayed intelligence. Splayed intelligence. Prabhupada writes Bhagavad Gita 241, Vayavasayatmika buddhi ekeha kuranandana bahushakahya nantashtya buddhayo vayavasayanam. Right? Buddhayo vayavasayanam. Those who are on this path are resolute in purpose and their aim is one. The intelligence of those who are irresolute is many branched. This many branched means divided, splayed intelligence. They don't, they, they can't make up their mind what they want. One minute they want one thing, next minute they want another thing. Yeah. So spiritual intelligence is one, but mundane intelligence is diverse, right? Material world, we, oh I want money, you get money and then you get a health problem. Oh I want good health, oh give me good health. And then you get good health and then you, you say, oh, I want, I, I, want, I want relief from the anxiety of the material world. So many problems with the family, so many quarreling, so many difficulties. Give me happiness. Oh, one thing after another. This is diverse intelligence. We don't know what is actually good for us. But spiritual intelligence is one. Prabhupada said, Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated that those who are captivated by the temporary beauties of the external energy forget the real aim of life, which is to go back to Godhead. Forgetting this, one tries to adjust things by various plans and programs, but this is like chewing what has already been chewed. Ooh. So, the temporary beauties of the external energy, or the beauty of the, the young woman or the young man, the beauty of the nice house, the beauty of the new car, oh, these kind of things, very temporary beauty. The real aim of life is to go back to Godhead. So we're like chewing the chute. We used to do that at school, you know, you take some chewing gum, and you chew it, get all the sugar out of it, and then we stick it under the table. Then somebody else would come along behind you, they'd take it off from under the table, they'd chew it again. <laughs> you know? So chewing, you know, there's no more taste in it, but still they'll try to chew it. The material life is like that. We're trying to get pleasure where there is no real pleasure. Nonetheless, the Lord is so kind he allows the forgetful living entity to continue in this way without interference. Thus this mantra of Sri Upanishad uses appropriate words. Yata, 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 huh? yata, yata, ta, yata, indicating that the Lord rewards the living entities 
just in pursuance of their desires. If a living being wants to go to hell, the Lord allows him to do so without interference. And if he wants to go back to Godhead, the Lord helps him. It's up to us. Where do you want to go? You know the story, Alice in Wonderland? You read that book? Anybody read that book, Alice in Wonderland? Have you heard of it? No? Anyway, there's a book, famous, famous English book, Alice in Wonderland. So she, she was in, you know, she was in the ordinary world, but she entered into the Wonderland. And when she came into the Wonderland, then she said, where do I go from here? So the people she met, they asked her, well, where do you want to go? She said, well, I, I don't really know. I don't know where I want to. Then they said, well, it doesn't matter which way you go. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't really know where you want to go, it doesn't matter. So some people like that, they don't know, they don't care. Oh, I'll go to hell, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> they don't realize what it's like in hell, how much suffering, how miserable it is unpleasant, so much pain and suffering is put there on the living entities in hell. So devotee is very conscious about where we're going. We want to go back to Godhead, we want to go back to be with Krishna, we want to go to the spiritual world. Don't want to go into hell, suffer miseries of life, and it's intelligent. So we should be, be clear about where we want to go. God is, God is described here as Paribu, the greatest of all. No one is greater than or equal to him. Other living beings are described here as beggars who ask goods from the Lord. The Lord supplies the things the living entities desire. Right? We can go to God and we can tell him, oh, give me rice, give me sugar, give me wheat. Give me, give me, give me. Just like you go in the store and you have a shopping list. So people go to God like that and they offer their prayers. Just tell Him what they want. This is like begging, the begging business. So this is not the real way to approach God. Krishna can give these things very easily. But He can give something much more. He can give the highest thing. If you want these things, you want, you just want to get food, you just want place to sleep, you just want comfort, that's there, that's easy. But if you want to get love of God, that's a little special. So we have to know what to ask for, what to desire. If the entity is equal to the Lord in potency, if they were omnipotent and omniscient, there would be no question of their begging from the Lord, even for so-called liberation. Right, if, but we're not omnipotent, we're not omniscient. <laughs> and and we, sometimes we do ask for liberation. Real liberation, however, means going back to Godhead. Liberation, as conceived of by an impersonalist, is a myth. And begging for sense gratification has to continue eternally unless the beggar comes to his spiritual senses and realizes his constitutional position. So the impersonalists, they, their goal is liberation. But for a devotee, liberation is not important. A devotee doesn't worry about liberation because our devotional service begins on the liberated platform. So we're not anxious for liberation. That's not important for the That's for the impersonalists, those people, the jnanis. They want, that's their goal. And they get it only after a long time. Prabhupada said, for them liberation is a myth. Another very, it's not really liberation. Begging for sense gratification, that's what materialistic people do. We don't want to keep begging, but when it comes to spiritual senses, 
and realizes his constitutional position, then he can actually take up devotional service. So we don't want to just keep going to God, telling him, oh, give me this, give me that. We should want to go to God to ask, how can I serve you? We should talk like that to God. It's nice to pray, but we should know how to pray, what to pray for. Don't, don't just ask God to give you money, give you a nice home, give you a long life. Don't just ask for that. That's the begging business. That's called cheating religion, kaitava dharma. You know, that, you know that they go to the temple and they stand in front of the deity and they say to God, I love you, I love you. But all the time they're thinking, where's the money? Give me money. So what kind of love is that? If you go to God just to, to, to get, that's not real love. So only, going ahead, only the Supreme Lord is self-sufficient. When Lord Krishna appeared on earth 5,000 years ago, he displayed his full manifestation as the personality of Godhead through his various activities. In his childhood, he killed many powerful demons. Oh, Mary, are you there? Mary? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, I'm here, yes. Okay, do you, do you remember when Krishna killed the demon Agasura? Who was Agasura? Uh, the, the long snake. The long snake. Oh, okay, yeah, big snake. What happened? How did Krishna kill him? Uh, uh, it's, uh, Isabel say, he, Lord Krishna go to the stomach and, yeah, and, read, and to save his friend and he expand himself until the, the snake got, got yeah. torn, got yeah. torn. Right, the snake had an open mouth, right? And all the cowherd boys right. walked in and yes, uh, Krishna walked in. Uh, yes. Uh, the friend walked in first, it's kind of to trap his friend and then uh, the friends got trapped in the stomach, yeah. uh, and then Krishna saw what happened and then Krishna went to rescue them, the friend. Okay, so that was Agasura. What about Bakasura? You know that, that demon, Bakasura? Bakasura, is the, Bakasura was the brother of Agasura. There were three, there were three in the family. There was Putana, Aga and Baka. They were all one family. Two brothers and one sister. So Baka, you know Bakasura? Who knows Bakasura? Uh, giant bird. Yeah, big bird. What kind of bird? It's got a big beak, right? It's got a big beak, yeah, a long beak. Like a crane. Yeah, like a crane, right? Big crane, giant crane. So, what did he do? How did Krishna kill him? By breaking the peak. Yeah. By breaking the, the, yeah. First, first of all, Bhaktasura swallowed Krishna. He came, he came forward, he swallowed Krishna. And, and then Krishna came out from the mouth of the Bhakta, and then he, he took the beak and he broke the beak. And he killed him, yeah. Okay, that was Bakasura, the, the bird. And then Shakatasura. Who knows that demon? Shakata means? Nobody know this demon? Shakatasura means the cart, the cart demon, right, the cart demon. You know what happened? Krishna was put underneath the car, right? Krishna was put underneath the cart. His mother put him for safety under the cart, but the cart was actually a demon. So then Krishna kicked the cart. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Are you Krishna. able to hear it? Yeah, I'm back now. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna.
Okay, so we talked about the demons and Prabhupada said, then, then Krishna picked up Govardhan Hill, but he didn't practice weightlifting. How long did he hold up the Govardhan Hill for? Seven days and nine. Yeah, held it up with what, what hand? Uh, left hand and little finger. Right, little finger. So did he have to go to the gym to practice lifting weights before he could do it? Mm -hmm. No. When the devotees were painting pictures, you know, in the beginning they, they didn't know how to paint Krishna's picture. So one devotee, they painted Krishna's picture, they gave him big strong arms, big muscles, you know. <laughs> because they thought, well, Krishna's killing all these demons and he holds up the Govardhan hill, he must be very strong. So they gave him these big strong arms like a weight lifter. And Prabhupada said, no, Krishna doesn't need muscles to do these things. Krishna's body is spiritual, so he doesn't have to do these kind of things. He doesn't depend on big muscles. And he danced with the gopis without social restriction and without reproach. What's the dance with the gopis called? What's the name? Krishna's dance, the Rasa Leela, right. The gopis approached him with a paramour's feeling of love. The relationship between the gopis and Krishna was worshipped even by Lord Chaitanya, who was a strict sannyasi and rigid follower of disciplinary regulations. Lord Chaitanya was very strict. You know, he had never had any contact with any woman, but still he, he thought the gopis are the greatest devotees of Krishna. So to confirm that the Lord is always pure and uncontaminated, Sri Ishopanishad describes him as Shudam, antiseptic, and Apavidam, prophylactic. Antiseptic, shudam. You know, antiseptic means you have some disease, you put some ointment on it, it's antiseptic, it will stop the disease from spreading and it will cure it, right? And prophylactic, prophylactic means it will protect you from getting the disease. Just like, you know, they have malaria prophylactic. You take this medicine, you won't get malaria. So Krishna is both antiseptic and prophylactic. He's both shudam and apavidam. Prabhupada explains, he is antiseptic in the sense that even an impure thing can become purified just by touching him. Right? If you have some disease, you have some infection, you put some antiseptic ointment on it and it will become cured. So the same way Krishna purifies everything just by his touch. He purifies. And then prophylactic refers to the power of his association. As mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, in the beginning a devotee may appear to be Sudurachara, not well behaved, but he should be accepted as pure because he is on the right path. This is due to the prophylactic nature of the Lord's association. Right? The devotee is not well behaved. He, doesn't, he does sometimes things not proper, but he's accepted as pure. Why? Because he's, because he's a devotee, because he's, he has, he's always thinking of the Lord, even though he has some bad habits, but he thinks of the Lord and he feels very bad about doing the bad things. Somehow he hasn't been able to give up the bad habits. So this is a prophylactic nature that soon he will become pure, that Krishna will protect him from falling away. 
So the Lord is apa vidam. Sin cannot touch him. Even if he acts in a way that appears to be sinful, such actions are all good. Because there's no question of Krishna ever being affected by sin. Just like dancing, Rasa Lila, Krishna is dancing with the young women in the forest. Is it sinful? No. It's a very pure activity. It's the most pure activity. And the, the women who come and dance with him, they're all pure devotees. And they come in their spiritual body. They don't come in their material bodies. They come in their spiritual body. So Krishna is not affected by sin. Just like Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharmam Parigyasna Mamikam Charanam. Krishna says, Surrender to me. I will free you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. Right? Krishna frees us from the sinful reactions because Krishna is apapvidam. That even though we have sinful reactions, Krishna will protect us from the reactions. He will protect us. Krishna said, Don't fear. I will protect you. So in all circumstances, he is shudam, most purified. He is compared to the sun. The sun can extract moisture from many untouchable places on the earth. Yet it remains pure. Just like we know in India, sometimes people, they will go out to pass their, you know, calls of nature, they will go out into the fields, they will go outside into, and they pass, and then the sun will come and the sun will purify everything. The sun does not get affected, the sun becomes contaminated. Even the sun shines on the public toilet. Public toilets may be a very contaminated place for us. But when the sun comes in the public toilet, the sunshine, then the sunshine purifies that place. So Prabhupada says like that, it purifies obnoxious things by the virtue of its sterilizing power. If the sun, which is a material object, is so powerful, then we can hardly begin to imagine the strength of the all-powerful Lord, right? This is, so this is Krishna. Shudam apapa vidam. He is antiseptic and he is prophylactic. Antiseptic, that he protects us, he can cure the disease and he's prophylactic. What was that? Are you hearing okay? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Any questions?